hey, that is not an appropriate use of a due date stamp. Well, like I was saying, if I were, you know, if this place is haunted, if, if I were to haunt this place, I would definitely haunt some patrons, especially the ones who don't play, pay for their fines. Oh my God, it's 12. I got to get started. Hi. Hi guys. Sorry. Uh, just going to get started. Hold on a minute. I forgot where I was. Um, okay. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. Uh, maybe it's, oh, it's just going to get started right now. Okay. Aloha, everyone, and thank you for joining, joining us for this month's Next Steps program. After a year of virtual meetings, are you confident hosting a professional meeting on Zoom or Microsoft Teams? Do you ever wonder how others see you and hear you during video meetings? Today's guest speakers will teach, teach you tips to help you in expect and expensively host successful meetings or training over Zoom and Teams. They will focus on sound quality, video setup, and lighting, and the special features in both platforms. Our speakers today are Mira Garud and Danielle Todd. Mira is an instructor and with the University of Hawaii at Manoa's Library and Information Science Program. Danielle is a staff development coordinator for HSPLS and her role in the system to assist staff at all levels develop their skills and comp to confidently assist patrons. First off, we have Mira. Hello, everyone. Can you all hear me? Okay. Well, I'm going to assume you can. Yeah, I see some reactions. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to take the first half of today's session and share with you specific uh, tips that I like to use for hosting Zoom meetings. And many of the tips that I'm going to share will cross platforms. So I'm going to focus on audio, looking your best, and also just general tips for facilitating good meetings held online. So I'm gonna get us started. And uh, one of the tips that I do that just helps me, and you know, everyone's different. So that's a general tip I have is use what works the best for you. Um, I talk through what I'm doing as I'm doing things in Zoom because nobody else can see me, right? Like they can see me, but they can't see my computer and what I'm doing. Um, in an in-person meeting where I am connected to a projector and I pull up my computer, you can actually see everything. Um, so I am right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to select share screen and select my slide deck. Okay, and here I am and I'm going to shrink my um, video so I don't see things over my slides. All right, so I am going to go ahead and get started. Um, some general tips for you for the first half of the session is any reactions or comments that you wanna share with each other or tips that you wanna share related to what I'm talking about, go ahead and put that in the chat so everyone else can see it. Okay, oh, and another tip I'm gonna share is, don't worry, I'm going to share the slide deck um, after, uh, after I'm done talking. So uh, I just want us to take a minute to kind of think about what makes for a good meeting or a class discussion. And you don't have to say anything aloud or um, put anything in the chat, but just think to yourself, what does it take a, for a class to uh, have a smooth class discussion or have a meeting actually accomplish what you set out to do instead of going somewhere else? Uh, so a few things come to mind. I have this image here because this is how this is how uh, I wish we could be. I wish we could see each other's body language, um, kind of see each other in a real space instead of just virtually. All right, so, um, but what comes to mind is things like uh, stuff that helps with teaching, right? Stuff that helps with facilitating. So environmental scanning, being able to read the room, being mindful of what's happening or grounded so that if something goes wrong, you can recover smoothly from it. Uh, other things that can help is having a detailed lesson or meeting plans um, or having an agenda that you share with everyone. So think about an in-person meeting, maybe you pass out physical copies of the agenda. Um, for a virtual meeting, you want to have that document ready to go and shared so everyone knows what's happening. So all of these come down to communication. So communication is really the core of any good meeting or program. Uh, really important to establish confidence and trust, have clear expectations, um, so everyone knows how they're participating. So I told you 
go ahead and use the chat panel to share any comments. If I hadn't done that, maybe some of you would be like, oh, is that welcome? I'm not sure. So setting those clear expectations can really help everyone feel like they're part of the meeting. Accessibility, this can be, uh, this can be done through different means. I'm thinking of, you know, did you share the link with everyone? Is it, did you remind them of the meeting? Uh, if they get kicked out for some reason, like their internet drops off, do they have that link? Have you shared it with them recently so that they can join back again um, and have a smooth experience? But it can also mean different settings within Zoom. So being sure to uh, use closed captions, for example, can be one way to make your meeting more accessible. Um, and ultimately, communication is all about, can you be heard? Can you see and be seen? Can you keep track of everything that's happening in the conversation? And uh, yeah, can you rejoin if you, can get, if you get disconnected? It's really different from an in-person meeting because you never just have the meeting space just disappear while you're sitting there at the table. Um, so have, being online adds an element of um, just confusion and possible, possible uh, yeah, things that go wrong. <laughs> okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do is actually give us, give everyone here a few different options for how we take the next uh, 25 minutes or so while I'm talking. So I have some tips for sounding your best. I have some, uh, so this is about, you know, do you sound natural? Do you sound like a human being? Or do you sound like you're underwater or muffled or like a robot? Put in the chat, how do I sound? Do I sound like I'm there with you? Or does it sound like, oh, it's hard to kind of make out what she's saying. So go ahead and put in the chat how, how that, how I'm sounding. And I'm gonna take a look at that right now. Oh, I sound clear, thanks, Cherise. Okay, nobody else has to if you don't want to. Loud and clear, wonderful. Okay, I swear, if I changed, this is a trick, this is a lie. I am not using this Bluetooth headset. If I were to use this, it would, I would sound like I'm underwater. Okay, thank you. All right, now looking your best. <laughs> so there's some downsides for this and there's some advantages. You know, looking your best gives you that confidence. It makes you feel good about what you're saying. I think audio is more important, but I understand people need to feel confident. So um, looking your best does require a setup. And that's the downside for this. A setup means lighting. It means camera angles. It means, um, and then once you add that, like once you raise your camera angle, then all of a sudden you're typing like a zombie with your arms out in front of you. So all of these setups, um, you know, there's pros and cons that you have to weigh. Okay, so I can talk about that. Uh, the third thing I can talk about is facilitating the meeting so that it just runs smoothly. So things like meeting settings, um, sharing documents, sharing your screen, using uh, interactive options within Zoom or outside of Zoom even. Okay, so with these three options, what should we focus on today? So I would like you to tell me what you would prefer to do. And I'm gonna go ahead and open this. It's a live poll hosted on Poll Everywhere. So I need to do a new screen share. And, oh, no, I don't. I just need to close this. There we go. So uh, yes, hopefully you're seeing my screen. Yes, looks like it. Okay, so I'm gonna put this in full screen and go ahead and go to pollev.com forward slash Mira. Um, I can put that into the chat too. You might hear some clicking sounds. Oh, and I didn't put the URL, mm, fail, see? One tip that I did not do is I usually have um, all of my URLs in a, in a notepad. I just can paste that in when I need to, but it looks like some of you are here. So pollev.com, we're seeing, okay, facilitating successfully. That is where everyone's at. I'm gonna let this go for another minute. Does anybody need more time? You can use the reactions panel and I'll take a look at that. You need more time. You can use any symbol to let me know you need more time. No, I don't see anyone saying they need more time. Okay, well, it's pretty clear winner facilitating successfully. Okay, well, great news. That's where I have the most. That's where I have the most stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and change my um, slide deck so that I am looking at all of that. All 
All right, so facilitating a meeting successfully. So there's a lot of settings that can make a huge, huge difference. And I'm going to um, walk through some of those settings, but I'll also talk about um, interactive tools and tips. So the main settings that I recommend is to set up in your Zoom preferences to mute your own audio and turn off your camera by default. This can really help prevent <laughs> lots of confusion and chaos um, you know, all those people that join meetings and you hear all this background sound and like shuffling papers, that means that their settings are not set to this. So I'm going to show you what this looks like. Um, you don't have to do this on the Zoom browser, but I'm doing this. Oh, actually, I think this one you do have to do on the Zoom browser. I'm using the Zoom in my browser because it has all, all the settings. So I'm sharing my screen. I've logged in already. So you just go to zoom.us, log in with your same Zoom account that you normally use and go to settings. And I'm gonna start sc scrolling through this and bear with me for a second while I get my tips here. Okay, so I'm um, just starting at the top. Require that all meetings are secured with one option. This is fine to enable because um, it does not make people log in. if anything, it just will turn on a passcode or it will enable the waiting room. And that's fine. You can do that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that on. I don't know why it was off actually. Uh, all right, so the waiting room. So this is nice to use. I use it to make sure that people, uh, I have control over when the meeting starts and people can come in. You may be annoyed with the waiting room as a meeting host. You may have noticed, oh, you keep having to click, 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 click to let people in but you are able to disable the waiting room once you're started and ready and, and on track. So leaving that on here is a good way to go. And within the waiting room options, there's some um, specific things that I, I really recommend enabling. So you have to use edit options here to change these. But what I, what I like to do here is, um, Everyone, I put everyone into the uh, the waiting room. That's what it was. Okay, everyone, continue. I don't know. I think I had to manually change that for some reason. So uh, I want everyone to go into the waiting room because I've had situations like office hours, for example, where I don't want students just coming in just because they have a edu account or just because or maybe a faculty member is dropping it and it's awkward so i make sure everyone will go into the waiting room uh let's see i like to have a passcode when scheduling new meetings it just increases your security um uh, one of the settings that i've reconfigured from the original default settings was to embed the passcode in the invitation link so i do this because um my meetings are not super, it's not like I'm posting these links on public websites. I'm inviting people through email or within a secured site like La Lima. So um, this makes it a lot easier for people to click to join without having to type in that passcode. All right. So I'm gonna skim down here a bit and this is where I get to um, the settings that I think is valuable. So uh, turning off, allow participants to join before host, making sure that's off is really good because um, otherwise people can start the meeting without you and then that makes them the host, they may be confused. So unless you really are in a tight knit team and you're all meeting all the time, I would leave this off. Okay, so now we're getting to the nitty gritty. <laughs> so. This is so surprising that for some reason I had to, like I thought the default would be to mute all participants when they join a meeting, but this is really, really helpful. So enabling mute all participants when they join, this prevents people from coming in with their audio on already. All right, facilitators, if it's okay with you, I'm going to turn off the waiting room because I'm getting, I know oh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry, I'll go ahead and enable it. I sh I'm not really the official host. Okay, I just keep seeing that pop up. Uh, okay, so I also enabled the meeting reminder. So I love this, Not it's not for everyone. 
Um, not everyone will like this. It might drive you nuts, but I like it because I tend to get distracted when I'm on my computer. So what this means is if I have my Zoom app open, which I have it already always open, then I get pop-ups reminding me of meetings that I have scheduled. It does not remind you of meetings that other people have scheduled. So that is important. But if you're the host for the meeting, it's so important that you're there on time. So I really like having this upcoming meeting reminder on. Um, other things that I want to not notify you about. Ooh, really, really important. So important that I have it here on my slides. Only turn on the sound notifications if it's really important. So I'm going to go back here. I have it turned off entirely. You can always add it um, to your meeting in real time if you need it. But this is that ding, ding that goes on and off and on and off during meetings that I can't, I actually cannot focus in the meeting when that's on. So um, please turn that off. Um, if you really need it for some reason, you can always just play the sound for yourself, for the hosts and the co-hosts. Keep in mind that your speaker might be a co-host. So right now I'm listed as a co-host. So if the sound were on, if this were enabled in this way, I would be hearing dings every time people came in and in and out. So I really think it's just worth not having it. Um, again, though, I welcome comments in the chat where you all can respond to each other about um, whether you use that or like it or what have you. Okay, I'm gonna keep going through my Zoom settings here. Just another minute. All right, so I enabled file transfer. Um, there's some reasons you wouldn't do this if you're, you know, if you're concerned about people sharing insecure files or um, viruses, things that might have viruses, you know, you can turn that off. I like it because I, my meetings are all with students. We're always sharing files with each other or my meetings are with colleagues, teachers, librarians. And I, you know, I trust that we have antivirus software on our computers. And I think this is a really helpful tool to use. So I use file transfer. And do I have anything else here? Um, I do allow everyone to share screen. This makes it easier during classes or meetings where we're all peers or, you know, colleagues. I think um, this goes for all the settings really choose this based on how how your participant who are your audience who are your participants are they your k through 12 students or your university students and you you know don't have a relationship with them you, you don't know them very well then maybe you would just do host only and you can always change that during the live meeting you can change this one during the live meeting um, but i have it set so that everyone can share because i don't i want to reduce how many things i have to change during my live meetings because I have a lot of live meetings. Okay, anything else here? Uh, don't think there was too much more that I wanted to show here. Um, I, I keep captions as an option and I allow virtual background for myself. This is really exciting. I'm gonna try to make sure I get to immersive view. It's really brief because I've never used it before. It's new as of I think May something. Okay, okay. Ah, there was one more thing. This one is so, 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 so helpful for me. So if, if you start or if you schedule a meeting and you forgot about it entirely, if somebody joins that meeting, um, either maybe they're early, maybe they're on time, but you're late, you get an email. So this is so helpful. Uh, it also, that email notification has a link that you can click from your email to open that Zoom. So you don't have to go looking for the link. So I leave this on. Um, sometimes it can also help if you're maybe missing a student or a participant and you're wondering where they are. You can check your email to see if maybe they clicked the wrong meeting link or something like that. So that's happened before too. Uh, so this is a useful, really useful feature. Okay, all right, that is it for my settings. Any specific question about um, the settings before I go through interactive options? I can put it in here in the chat. Okay, that's okay. So I have a little grid for interaction options. Um, within Zoom, you noticed I did not use Zoom polls. Um, 
for a few different reasons. Uh, Zoom polls are great, don't get me wrong. I really like Zoom polls. But the downsides is it's not free for basic accounts and only the original host of the meeting can actually add that poll. And you have to add the poll before the meeting starts. So if I came in here and said, hey, Sharice, I wanted to use a Zoom poll, she would have had to end the meeting, go to her browser, log in, add the poll, oh, just forget it. So um, you know, you can set that up ahead of time, but I don't really count on using Zoom polls unless I'm the host of the meeting. So I've gotten, um, I've seen different options. People use different options. They use Google Forms where you can um, paste the, the Google Form link into the chat. Um, I use Poll Everywhere because it's something I've been using before anyway, and I, I'm used to the interface and uh, I like it. So I use Poll Everywhere. Other people use Mentimeter. It's another option that is free with an upgrade uh, where you can upgrade to have more features. All right, so that's how you can get input. You can also, of course, get input using the chat box. So you can, of course, ask questions and just see what people are typing in the chat box. But if you wanted anonymous feedback or input, then using a poll or a form is the best is the best way to go. Okay, so um, another thing that I like to do during meetings is to interact um, with some with actual content with web content. So um, in a real meeting in person, you might have a whiteboard or you might have those big butcher paper where you, everyone can write notes and share with each other. So you can do something similar by getting really, really crafty. Well, maybe not really, really crafty. Just get crafty and comfortable with using Google Docs if you want to use something outside of Zoom. So Google Docs, um, the most important thing is to make sure what I do is I, when I create, I'll go here, um, when I create a, a file, I'll, the first thing I do is I set the share settings to share with whoever needs it to, needs to edit it. Um, are you seeing this, the share options? It says loading right now. I don't know, this might take too long. Yeah, we just see the loading, sorry. Okay, it's taking too long. So, oh, I think it's because it needed a, a name, yeah. Okay, so uh, the first thing I do is share. And thank you, Danielle, for <laughs> responding to. You can share with specific people. Um, I would usually turn off the notification because I haven't put anything in the document yet. Um, but you can also just share with everyone um, with the link. And you also have to remember to click editor if you actually want them to edit the document as if it were a whiteboard. And then you can, um, something that helps inside your Google Docs is to just put in a table or use headers as a way to make sure people know where to type. Because otherwise people go to the document and then they don't know where to type. So you can put in, good luck writing your thoughts. Whatever, sorry about the keyboard sounds. It's right next to my microphone. Uh, yeah, and then people can start filling in their thoughts. Okay, so Google Docs is really helpful. And then when you share it, you, Okay, fine. <laughs> you can copy the link and put that into the chat. All right. So uh, ooh, why don't I share that with you? Just why not? Why not, Mira? Go ahead. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Good luck, Brian. You don't even know what thoughts to, to share. Okay, but that's okay. Um, another option for interacting in documents is actually really amazing. It's called Pear Deck. And this is interactive slides um, it's really, really powerful. There is a slight learning curve, but once you get the hang of it, you can create slides that your students or your participants can interact with on their computer. It's really powerful. Um, and then of course, within Zoom, there's the whiteboard option and the annotate option. The downsides for this is that your, all your participants need to be in the Zoom app that doesn't work from the browser. And it actually does not work from a Chromebook. So a lot of, um, a lot of students use Chromebooks. So um, not the best option for that, for that audience. Okay, I'm gonna skip several of these. Um, yes, this is the full page. I took a screenshot of the full page of settings. It's super long, but I went through all of those already. And what I wanna do is really briefly show you how it works to add a poll within Zoom. So once you've um, 
Once you've created a meeting, you can um, scroll down to that. You click on meetings tab, go to your meetings, and then click edit or manage your whatever the meeting is that you have. And at the bottom, very, very bottom, you see this option to add a poll. So this is how you add the polls. This is why nobody does it because it's buried. Um, so you click add a poll. It's super easy though. You just type in your question, you put in options, you can have single choices or multiple choices. Um, I am so sorry. I thought I had another slide. Oh, no, no, I do, I do. It's somewhere else. Um, so this is how you add the poll. So then once you've added the poll and connected it with the meeting that you are going to be using, then you can actually use polls built in. Okay, so I have a few minutes left and I want to get into what you should do when you first start that meeting so that it goes smoothly. So the first thing I do when I start a new meeting or start the meeting is I go up here to this icon, the green icon at the top, and I make sure that I'm in the right meeting. Um, so once you press that, this pops up and it tells you the name of the meeting. It gives you the link, which is helpful because you can copy it and send it to anyone. And if you really want to check how your computer is doing, how your connection is, you can click on this gear icon. And that gear icon takes you to your statistics, which tells you if your computer is overwhelmed, if, which my computer was at the time, it was a little bit, um, I was doing a lot of things. I was, I think I was recording my screen and taking screenshots while I had Zoom running. So it was overall uh, very high memory usage. And it also shows your connection type and your bandwidth. So this is, um, this is just a good way to help you troubleshoot if you're having problems with your connection. And then once you're in the meeting, uh, this is where you can control the waiting room. So I usually, once I'm ready, once I feel like I'm good to go, that's where I will click this again to turn it off. That way I don't get notifications that people are in the waiting room. Oh, and I wanna go to waiting room again. So um, Cherise folks did a great job with the waiting room. They had um, an image and instructions. You can set that up as well, um, also through your Zoom browser and your, your settings. Uh, so that way people know that they're in the waiting room and it's not just a generic message. So that was really nice that they did that. Okay, so this is how the poll works if you're actually, if you've actually succeeded in setting it up. Um, so if you have your poll attached to the meeting, then when you click polls, it shows you the poll and then you launch polling. Then um, this is the screen you see as the host and it tells you in real time um, how many people voted. So this is helpful. This is something that doesn't work with poll everywhere. Uh, and so, yeah, having this here is really helpful. It tells you how long the poll has been running. Um, and then when you're done, you hit end polling and you get, you can either download the results or you can share them and or share them. Uh, I like to share them with the audience. Uh, it depends on the question, of course. And then when you click share results, then this is what you see when you're sharing the results. And it tells you that the, the viewers or the attendees are viewing the results. All right, so um, this is what the chat settings look like. And this is where you can attach a file if, if you have that setting enabled. All right, so in the last couple of minutes that I have, I wanna really emphasize the optimized video clip. Now this is a double-edged sword. So if you really want to share videos, you need to share sound and optimize your video clip. But optimizing for video clip means that any Zoom panels that you have open, say you're monitoring the chat or you're looking at the participants or even your thumbnail video, all of that is gonna show up as a gray overlay over your video and over your content. So what I do when I'm sharing a video is I will optimize for video clip, but then I do a new share or I use the, um, the expand, uh, there's like a little arrow on the share screen right down here, down here, the little arrow. Um, so you can click that and change the settings back so that it does not optimize for video clip. So let's say you're showing your slides, you should play the video, that's where you optimize for video clip. You go back to your slides, make sure you check that, uncheck it so that there's no gray overlays over your slides. 
Okay, so um, if any of you have used the advanced share screen options, I have not. Um, you can share your advice in the, in the chat. And I'm gonna skip through these, but uh, like I said, I'm gonna share my slides. You can see how the annotation works in Zoom as the host. So this is what I would see if I were um, allowing annotation to happen in Zoom. Skip through this and uh, ending on enable auto transcription. I always turn this off, or sorry, I turn this on so that anyone can see the captions if they need it. But then once they have it on, I click hide subtitles so that I don't see myself talking with the, the subtitles because I find it distracting. And I also tell all my participants that. I'm so sorry. I just kind of like ran through all these tips and didn't have a whole a lot of time for um, hands-on exploration. But what I'm gonna do is pop this link into the chat box. And this means you can go ahead and take a look at my slides at your convenience. Mahalo, thank you. I'll turn it over to Danielle. Hey, thanks, Mira. Um... Yeah, there's a lot. It's when we were trying to come up with slides, there's like, oh, like I could take two hours to talk about either one of these. So um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Okay, I'm gonna share my slides and we're gonna start talking about uh, Microsoft Teams. Um, and what I'm gonna do is I like to share my full screen. So you're going to see Mira's face in a weird hall of mirrors for a second. So hold on. Oh, nope, didn't do that, see? Okay, now you should see my slides. We're going to talk about Microsoft Teams. Um, I also am going to try and um, put a few interactive things in there so we can try them out. Um, so basically, I'm going to try and run through a lot of things, but they I'm not going to spend a lot of time on all of it. But um, my guess is that if you are not an HSPLS person, you probably haven't been using Teams a lot. If you are in HSPLS, um, you're probably really sick and tired of Teams. So we're going to go over it um, just a little bit. So quick question. I want you to put into chat right now, which are you more familiar with? Are you more familiar with Zoom or are you more familiar with Teams? Zoom, Zoom, Teams, Zoom, 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 Teams, Zoom, Zoom, Zoom. Yeah, like I said, it really comes down to are you in the public library system or not? Because HSPLS has been utilizing, use, using Teams a lot. I was going to say utilizing and it came out funky. OK, good job. So what is the difference between Zoom and Teams? Zoom is a meeting platform. It also has a webinar component, um, which I could spend a whole lot of time talking about the differences between those two things. Um, you can scale them up or scale them down. Um, for our last training session that we did, um, we had to buy an expansion pack for large meetings because it was a, we had 300 people in a training. So yeah, you can kind of scale it up or down. And it has really, really easy recording features, which is to me, one of the big um, draws. Teams is actually for meetings, but it's more of a collaboration tool and it's similar to Slack. So it really works best for mid-sized or small meetings that are within an organization um, due to the security settings. Um, but you also has chat and call capabilities. Um, another thing is that it is updating constantly and it is a Microsoft product. So Microsoft doesn't necessarily tell you about any of the updates um, as we're gonna see uh, because updates are deployed differently at different times. Sometimes people are seeing things um, that you as the host aren't seeing. So when they're telling you they're trying to find a setting and you're telling them to look in the upper right hand corner, it might not be in their upper right hand corner. So that's something to be aware of. Um, I'm going to go over a little bit about Teams navigation. So a team within Teams is for members only of that team and it's a collaborative workspace. A channel would be within a team and it's a specific area within that team. So for example, a team that I have is training development. And then within that we have channels um, for different projects we were working on. So if you were working on the ARSL you know, conference, you would only work in that channel. 
and just keeps things organized. Um, it also has chat and it's you can chat with people who are within your organization. You don't have to be in a team with them. You can just send them a chat or call them. There's a meet now feature, so you don't have to schedule things. You can just call somebody right away. Um, and then there's also standalone meetings. Those can happen across the organizations. Um, you can send meeting invites directly from your calendar. Um, and it, you can also send um, standalone meeting invites to guests to join. And we're only going to talk about standalone meetings. I just wanted you to be aware of some of the terminology that gets thrown around within teams that people um, kind of don't necessarily understand when you're talking about putting in a channel or a chat. Okay, so joining a team. Um, it's going to, again, depends. Are you inside or are you outside the organization? There's going to be different things. So I'm going to show you a couple examples. If you are outside the organization and you get a Teams meeting invite, it's going to be an email that comes in. But really, all you need to worry about, and it looks the same if you get an email within the organization, there's going to be a little block at the bottom, um, and it'll say um, join from the computer or mobile app. You can also call in if you needed to, but basically you click on that link and it'll take you to the meeting. Um, when you do that, it should take you to a screen that looks like this, um, and so you can either download the app or continue in the browser. I really recommend downloading the app. Um, it's just a much better experience. You have more options. Joining from the browser really limits what you're able to do. So if you're within the organization, you can get to any of your meeting invites that you've been sent just by going to your calendar. So one thing that happens is you get a meeting invite, you RSVP, yes, I'll go, and then the meeting disappears. Um, you don't have that email anymore. What it's done is actually just put it automatically on your calendar. So just click on that, it'll take you directly into the meeting. So that's how to join. Uh, and when you enter a Teams meeting, you're going to be faced with a big black square that looks like this. Basically, what it's doing is it's trying to set you up so that you're um, not coming in with a hot mic <laughs> or your camera on or whatever. So there's all these different settings within that. So you can turn your video on or off. You can apply a background. Um, that's only in the app. You can't do a background if you're in the browser. Um, you can check your audio settings there, make sure it's picking up the correct microphone. You can adjust the volume of your microphone, all that stuff. So just to show you, this is a virtual background that's preloaded in Teams, but you can also add your own. OK, um, I would like for you to raise your hand for me if you feel confident participating in a Teams meeting. And I know not all of you are on Teams, so you might not be able to know. So I have one hand raised. I got a clap, th four, three hands raised and a clap. So I'm going to take that as five, okay, five hands raised, one clap, but we've got 24 participants. So that to me shows that we are not super confident. Okay, so let's go over a few things. I got a kinda. Yeah, see, it depends, right? So I'm going to go over a few things that might help you um, when you're participating in a Teams meeting, just to feel more confident. So one of the things I mentioned earlier is this two views of the same meeting, depending on if you're joining from the app or if the desktop app or if you're joining from a browser. Also, you might have the desktop app, app but you haven't updated to the newest version of Teams. So what you can see is some very big differences, um, particularly in the navigation at the bottom. Um, the older versions of Teams are going to have a navigation bar that hovers and it'll disappear after a while and you have to you know, move around on the bottom screen to get it to come back up. And that's where you'll see things like unmute yourself or your camera or all those things. The newer version of Teams has that where it's always on display and it's in the top right. So that's something to note. Um, if you come in to Teams, take a second to really look and see like, Okay, did it move anything around on me? 
Um, that's also a really good reason that whenever you join a Teams meeting, that first um, page that comes up to put up your settings, or if you're going to turn your video on or your microphone on, um, turn both of those off coming in because you might come in and be very confused about how to do that at first because it does move around with pretty much no warning as far as I've been able to tell. Um, this is what all of the controls are. There's a lot. Um, there's a lot of settings within Teams um, and there's a lot of other things going on. But uh, one of the big ones that you should know about is those three dots in the middle. It gets overlooked a lot, but that's where you can put in um, your device settings. So if your audio is not working, you can turn on closed captions. You can change how you're viewing the meeting. That's where you record. There's a lot in those three dots. So check those three dots out. When you're viewing, uh, there's a couple different ways you can view your meeting. So this is the standard view in Teams. It kind of does the little block thing that we're used to with Zoom, but it also does a strange thing where it puts all the videos also at the bottom. So you might see some of the videos up at the top in big squares and then a long line of squares or dots um, with either the person's profile picture or initials along the bottom. So one thing you can do when somebody is giving a presentation and you want to focus, but maybe people have their cameras on in the bottom and you know you keep watching everybody else watching the presentation, which is something I'm definitely guilty of. You can go to focus mode and what that's going to do is it's just going to um, change the view of the meeting so that you don't see everybody else's videos, you only see what's being presented. So it basically it just cuts off that bottom part moves it up. Um, also, you can see in this fake meeting, my um, stress ball uh, toy was my participant. Um, the other one that they're rolling out in terms of how you're viewing your, your meeting is called together mode. And basically it puts everybody's videos and makes you sit in like a big auditorium. Um, it is not my favorite. I don't, I haven't been able to figure out why I would be using this. As you can tell from my face and the screenshot, I am not impressed. Um, but it's something you can play around with. Um, probably don't play around with it when you're in the middle of an important meeting because it is very distracting. Uh, the other thing is chat in Teams. I think chat in Teams is probably my favorite feature of it because it's very robust. Um, Zoom and chat, you really can just kind of you know, write really quickly and send stuff. The chat in Teams um, has all kinds of regular chat functions, but you can also format what you're saying if you click on the little A with the pencil next to it. So you can bold things or whatever. Um, you can send files. You could put an exclamation point to make it say this is an important message. You can send stickers and GIFs. So you can do a lot with it. One of the things because of security, um, it might not be available for guests. So if you invite someone in to a Teams meeting from outside of your organization, they might not be able to get to chat. Um, this is a security feature. And I know within HSPLS, we would actually have to talk to ESSS, our um, IT department, about going in at an admin level and changing it. So it's not something that you can change just as someone sending out an invitation. OK. So I'm just checking my time because I want to make sure we have time. I'm going to go over being a host. Um, one thing that I wanted to do is uh, just a demonstration of one of the tools you can use that's super easy and free that's already built into any type of platform called Chatterfall. So what I want you to do is we're all going to press send at the same time. So I want you to answer this question, but don't press send until I say so. So on a scale of one to five, how comfortable are you with hosting online meetings? So go ahead and open your chat and scale of one to five, one being not comfortable at all, five being I'm good to go. How comfortable are you? Okay, ready? And I'm going to say when. One, two, three, send. Okay, I'm getting ones, twos, threes. I got a, ooh, I did get a five, fours. Awesome. I've got a couple of people I think are good to go. I have other people that maybe need some practice. So that technique is called a chatterfall. 
Um, and why I do that is sometimes you're asking something that's more in depth than a scale of one to five, um, but you want people's real opinion um, and you don't want it based off of whatever the fastest person typing says, because that can take you down a rabbit hole. So if you're trying to just get what is your opinion on this, everybody put your opinion, one, two, three, go, you give everybody's opinion rather than basing it off of the first opinion that comes up. Um, my five tips to help yourself um, if you're going to do a presentation, any type of presentation, um, sign in earlier than you think you need to. Something always goes wrong. And anyway, if you sign in early and no one else is there, just have it on in the background and then when you're ready, go on. It's better to sign in early. Um, I'm standing to do this presentation because it is a kind of mental trick for me. If I'm standing, I'm on. Um, I'm used to doing that when I do a presentation. So even if I'm going to be standing by myself in a room, it really helps me to be in that mode. If I'm doing a meeting, it's fine to sit down. But if I'm doing a presentation like this, I'm going to try and stand. Have water nearby. Don't look at the participant list. As soon as you look at that, you're going to start thinking about, oh my gosh, there's so many people here, whatever. Um, oh, I didn't know this person was going to come and now I'm really nervous. And the other thing I recommend is to use icons inside your presentation to cue yourself to what you're doing. So you may have noticed whenever I've asked you to interact, there's a little icon next to it. And that's for you to kind of know, but it's really for me to say, oh, right, I need to pull up my chat so I can see everybody's um, thing. So that I, I've started doing that and that helps me a lot to have those icons. Um, the other thing, I want to make sure we have time. Okay, before you host, um, these are some questions. Um, and I actually got, they're based on the Art of Gathering by Priya Parker. Um, it's really an interesting book and thought about it. But before you meet, it helps you to think about why are we meeting? What is the purpose of this? Because then you can design your entire meeting around what the purpose is, instead of just going, okay, I need to come up with an agenda. I need to do this, this, and this. If it doesn't further the purpose, then rethink how you're doing it. Who needs to attend and who does not need to attend? That's really important for not only not taking up people's time, but also sometimes when we invite different people into the room, it changes the tone. So if you really want to have a meeting where I want everybody in a particular field's feedback, maybe don't invite their bosses because they might feel a little bit um, intimidated to say what's really on their mind. What are your handrails? And what this means is going into a meeting or into a new experience, giving people something to hold on to so that they know what to expect. Um, if you give things ahead of time, um, either an agenda or a worksheet, um, maybe your slides, you can also say up front, like, I'm very happy for you to interrupt me at any time. Or sometimes you say, I'm trying to get a clean recording. So if we could hold all questions to the end, that's another thing you can do. So just give something people to hold on to so that they know what's going on. Uh, what's your opening and what's your closing? Um, they've done some research and people really remember the first five minutes and the first 10 minutes or first five, first 10 and last 10 of whatever you're doing of an event. And that includes virtual meetings. So if you spend the first 10 minutes talking about um, rules and regulations, everybody needs to sit down, blah, 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 blah. That's probably what they're going to remember. If you want to have an opening that people remember, um, try and do it that way. What are you priming people to think? Um, another th good thing about openings is, are you going to play music in the beginning? Are you going to have slides so that people know what's coming up? The slides can also be really helpful if you show people how to navigate the online platform. So that way, that's another handrail. So start it a little bit early, have those slides up saying, this is where chat is, this is where this is. That way, they kind of know what's going on. Um, and also, this isn't in Art of Gathering, but does this need to be accessed later? And that, especially in Teams, is going to dictate how you send out the invite. I could get into a whole thing about where do you put a meeting in Teams, but if you are not within an organization that uses Teams, it gets really into the weeds, um, which might be something in HSPLS. If you guys are interested in learning that, let me know, because that's kind of my job. 
Okay, so technical stuff, if you are hosting, um, again, those three dots are gonna be a huge help to you. If you click on those, one it says meeting options, and this is similar to the security thing that Mira was showing us with Zoom. This is where you can turn off everybody's mics or cameras. Um, you can also turn off chat a lot of times. You can say who can bypass the lobby so you're not getting those chimes, and that's how you're going to do that within a Teams meeting. Share screen, again, because you are depending on your view, if the navigation bar is on the bottom, you're going to see something that looks like this on the left. Um, it allows you to pick either your desktop, so your full screen or a particular screen. Um, you can also choose a particular window. You can also upload a file to present. The same thing happens in the navigation bar at the top. It's just that the display looks a little bit different. The big thing is include your system or computer sound if you're going to be sharing any videos. Otherwise, people will just see the image. They won't be able to hear anything. So just turn that on if you're going to be sharing any video. One of the cool features in Teams is presenter mode. So if I chose up here, if I chose on, you can see it better probably on the right, um, a PowerPoint Live. So these are some of my PowerPoints that I've been working on. I can also browse and pick a different one and I can upload it and I'll be able to use a presenter view. So that way it's similar to presenter view if you've ever used PowerPoint to give a presentation in you know, person. Um, you can see all of your slides, you can see your notes, you can also really easily access the participants and chat and have everything on one screen, no problem. Um, it's great if you're only going to use PowerPoint. If you're going to be switching between screens, maybe sending people to a poll or different things outside of that meeting, I wouldn't recommend it because you have to keep unsharing and resharing. It's kind of a pain. Um, I usually opt for the share your whole screen because then I know whatever I'm seeing, everyone's seeing. Um, some people don't like to do that because um, maybe they have a bunch of different things up, but I just, if I have it, I'd rather you just be able to follow whatever I'm doing. Oh, really important in presenter mode, because I have used it for some trainings, um, especially ukulele training. Um, this little eye, when you upload your slides to Teams, that means that people who are participating can click through and go at their own pace, which is kind of nice, but also really hard if you're trying to keep everyone on the same page. So what you want to do is you want to click on that and disable it, because otherwise what happens is people don't realize that you've progressed a slide, you're no longer controlling them on their end, they're seeing whatever they want to see, and then they don't keep up with what you're talking about. So if you are going to use presenter view and teams, make sure you click on that eye, put a line through it. Um, breakout rooms do exist in teams, but they're really not as robust as Zoom. Um, but for example, there is no pre-assign currently available. And that's where you would get to breakout rooms and teams. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff on Teams, HSPLS staff, if you go to Niche Academy, there are curated materials under technology for Teams, and they are specific for HSPLS teams. If you're curious and you're not within HSPLS um, staff, um, there's Microsoft tutorials on their website, and I also really like the playlist, um, Kevin Stravert, um, he has a huge playlist on using Microsoft Teams, and that's really where I pulled a lot of the stuff from to put in our staff's Niche Academy. And real quick, I'm going to go over some fun stuff, cool things that you can do um, in meeting engagement. There's hand raising, which we did. There's Chatterfall, which we did. If you were in Teams, then you can use Microsoft Forms and embed those into the chat and people can do real quick polls. Um, I like to use PowerPoint for note taking. So you might notice that I keep exiting out. And what I do is I can make my slides really small and I make it so that this, oops, well, this is hidden so that it doesn't show all my stuff. There's also a thing called clump and dump for brainstorming that I wanna come up with a better name for. And the whip is just basically a roll call. Okay. 
So clump and dump is when I would basically put people into breakout rooms, say, okay, what are common issues with online meetings? And you would come back and I'd say, okay, yellow group, what was one of your things? And somebody would give me an answer. And then over time we'd get things and we'd say, okay, so maybe it's a technical issue. Maybe one's an agenda issue. And that's how you kind of go through it. You put the different issues, you categorize it. So that way you kind of have a clearer picture of what's going on. And that's a really easy tool to use within Teams or on Zoom or anything. Um, it's super helpful. Um, similar to what um, Mira presented, I use Mentimeter. I think it's really helpful. I like that it's um, you can do different graphics and text. Um, I have a free account, which means I'm limited to two um, polls that I can run. Um, Pick a reel is absolutely free. And basically you create a big spinner wheel um, to randomly call on people or make decisions. Mural is a similar to whiteboard, but with tons of added features. If you haven't looked into Mural, I recommend it. Um, and Pear Deck, I haven't gotten to use, but I'm dying to. It's really cool. Um, just if you haven't seen Mentimeter, here's an example I actually used with Mira's class. So I did a poll, but you can actually embed GIFs into it. So these are all from Schitt's Creek. And then these were the results. <laughs> Hopefully we're getting better on what is your Zoom experience. Um, so this is Picker Wheel. And just real quick, I'm going to show you what picker wheel looks like. Um, this is a leftover. You can create lists from it. And then you, I used it to call on people. And then you spin. So Manoa would have been the lucky people to have to talk when we came back from break. So. Sorry, this was incredibly fast. I would have loved to spend more time, um, but thank you so much. I think we have four minutes. <laughs> I'm gonna stop sharing. Thank you, Danielle and Mira. That, those are really good tips. Um, I think I'm confident in Teams because I use it every week, but I learned, I've learned so much from you, Danielle and Mira too. Zooms, I, I think I'm more of like a, a three. I use it, but not as regular as Teams, but yeah. Um, so thank you for um, doing the presentation and also thank you everybody for for uh, coming in today. This concludes our program. Thank you for joining us for this month's Next Step program. Next month's, uh, next month's program will be a special two-part workshop with HLA Centennial Committee. To prepare for our Centennial, we'll have two workshops to help you to write up the history of your library and the pioneers who helped shape librarianship in Hawaii. The first workshop will be on June 24th at 12 p.m. And it's titled Gathering Our History Slash History, Oral, Store, Oral History Interviewing Basics. And it'll be presented by Andrew Wertheimer. This first workshop will introduce you to the basics of oral history methods so that you can start work on your own project. Doing oral history interviews is an ideal method for gathering firsthand recollections recollections um, of our library's pioneers and to help us see things from their eyes. It is a chance for us to honor our pi pioneers and learn from their challenges and victories. Dr. Wertheimer will cover some basics, including ethics, coming up with a good, good open-ended questions and re recording and transcribing. Today's program is made possible through HLA members like you to join or to continue to support HLA, check out our social media. Again, thank you everybody for joining and I hope you have a good day and we'll send out a recording of this. Thank you. <laughs>